thing. There it goes. Okay. <clears throat> These cells run from the surface of the cerebellum to the brain stem, and because of this, we are able to do all the things that we, that we can do. So we can, we can write, but we can also draw pictures, we can paint, uh, we can do all kinds of interesting things because we, all of this stuff is tied together. And because of the organizational structure, that's one of the reasons why uh, we have this capability. Now, the cerebellum really doesn't have anything to do with why you become a... Uh, why you uh, drift into schizophrenia if uh, essentially you have that proclivity and you smoke something like marijuana, or you take speed, or you use crystal meth. The reason that we pick on marijuana so much is because normally people don't just start out with heroin. They don't just shoot up heroin one day. Usually they start out with, they drink alcohol, they smoke cigarettes, and then they drink alcohol, then they smoke pot. Then they go on to harder things because they're not getting the buzz that they really are looking for. But you usually don't start with the hard stuff. Normally you start with the softer stuff, the tobacco, the alcohol. Uh, the intricacy of the Purkinje cells allows the cerebellum to control both the fine and the gross motor functions of the body, and that's what I was just talking about. Uh, some of us aren't nearly as coordinated as other individuals. Uh, some people like LeBron James, uh, Tiger Woods, I don't know if you uh, saw the commercial where Tiger Woods is bouncing a ball on the head of his club, he flips it up in the air and then hits it. That's kind of amazing if you think about it. I could probably do that with a tennis racket, but then again the head of a tennis racket is this big. But he's doing it with a, I don't know, a five iron or something, and he's bouncing it up and down on the head of the, uh, of the, uh, of the golf club, and he does it five or six ten times, I'm not exactly sure, but then he pops it up and he hits it, which is not, which is a trick, which is a bit of a trick. The position of the cerebellum between the spinal cord and the thal uh, th thalamic uh, centers that communicate with the motor complex allows it to control motor function. And that's the most important thing. You've got the spinal column here, You've got your uh, thalamic center in the middle of your brain, and in between, of course, you have the, the cerebellum. So you've got the cerebellum that's controlling all of these actions, and it gives you your capability to do something, uh, to do anything. <clears throat> okay, and these, these, this is caused by those fan-shaped Purkinje cells, because they are connected, and they're interconnected. And since they are interconnected, we can do very intricate things. We, we don't just move one finger, we can move two fingers, we can do different things with, with our thumbs and our, and our fingers, um, making it, uh, making us able to do uh, some fairly intricate uh, movements. The cerebellum leads into the pons, the first portion of the brainstem. Pons is, uh, is actually Latin for bridge, it's also French. Uh, the, uh, I used to live in a town called Zweibrücken. Uh, which in German means two bridges, uh, and it, the French called it, didn't call it Zweibrücken, they called it Dupont. And of course that means, Du means two and Pont means bridges, so two bridges, it was called two bridges. It was a bridge across the um, Meuse, I think. Anyway, I used to live in Zweibrücken. I was stationed in Zweibrücken. Interesting place, right on the uh, French border. Uh, we used to uh, look across the mountain all, all across the hill, and it was France on the other side. It was Germany on our side, and it was France on the other side. It's not like they had a border that you couldn't cross. It was a, it was a fence. It was just a wide, it was just an old fence too, so you could you could step over it wherever you wanted to. Of course, why in the world would you want to go to France? It's just another pasture on the other side of the of the fence. Anyway, Dupont's. Uh, the ponds is uh, involved in motor control and sensory analysis. Information from the ear uh, first enters the brain in the pons. So when you hear something, of course, you're, you're analyzing it, you're, you're taking in the information, you're trying to figure out what's going on, uh, and that takes place, first takes place in the pons. The bottom of the brain stem is, is made up of the medulla. Uh, we used to call it the medulla oblongata, now we just call it the medulla. Medulla merely means the middle, or inside, the marrow. <clears throat> The medulla controls both the neck and the tongue muscles, so my capability to speak, which is sometimes questionable, uh, comes from my from, comes from the medulla, my medulla. 
The medulla also contributes to the regulation of breathing and heart rate. So if I'm low to this area, especially if there's swelling taking place, uh, causes a, a, can cause coma, cause you to go into a coma. It can also kill you. Uh, this is one of the problems if somebody has uh, a uh, automobile accident and they get a blow to that part of the, of the skull, they will stop breathing right away. So we have to put an artificial respirator on the, uh, on, on the individual and we have to stimulate their heart. And we can do that for a prolonged period of time. Um, I told you that I worked in a hospital where we harvested organs and we sent them down. Yeah, okay. We'd sit them down the road. It was only like a block down for the other hospital, but they did all the uh, transplants. This is Nebraska Medical Center, and um, there was a uh, Catholic hospital down the, down the road that did uh, transplants as well. So we didn't have to transport them very far. We could actually walk them down the road, uh, but normally they put it they put it in an ambulance and drove it over there. Hearts, lungs, whatever. Kidneys, <clears throat> transplanting everything that we possibly could. The main intellectual functions uh, occur in the cerebral cortex. And cerebral cortex merely means external layer. Cerebral cortex, uh, the, the portion that is the thinking portion of your brain, is, is all gray matter. It's not white matter. If it were white matter, uh, then your thoughts would be like electricity and potentially you'd go insane. Of course, we'd get used to it after a while, but it's gray matter. There are six layers of uh, the cerebral cortex. Uh, it contains somewhere between 50 billion and 100 billion uh, neurons. And, uh, so <laughs> how do we know which one it is? Uh, people with big brains uh, have, have, more, uh, have more neurons. That's not the way it works. Uh, the more uh, intellectual stimulation you get, uh, the more uh, neurons you're going to have. It's the way it normally functions. The functions of the various regions of the cerebral cortex have been mapped and divided into 46 distinctive areas uh, known in toto as uh, Broadman's areas. And of course, we didn't know any of this until we could uh, start visualizing what was going on in the, uh, in the human brain. Uh, and now that we can do e EEGs and uh, we can do MRIs and CAT scans and whatnot, now we have, uh, we have mapped all of this out, so we understand where different, different types of thoughts come from. The most numerous neuron in the cerebral cortex is the pyramidal cell. The pyramidal cell looks a lot like a Purkinje cell. Uh, it has many, many dendrites. Uh, it spreads horizontally uh, out so that uh, if you have one thought, you can tie it to another thought. And that's what was going on this morning. I was thinking about dreams this morning. Dreams, I had a really strange dream last night about being in the military, of course. <laughs> but I was also in college at the same time. So it was like being in college in the military. And so I had people that were my bosses uh, telling me what to do. Telling me what to do and uh, <clears throat> Uh, how, how these two things got tied together, I'm not exactly sure how they got tied together, but that's the way it worked. Uh, everything got tied together. College and uh, the military got tied together. So here I am, I'm dreaming about uh, people ordering me around, and I was in college and had to go to class. And, you know, it, was, it was really kind of a fat. Kind of an interesting thing that these two that these two things were, were tied together. I don't know if you've ever had a, a dream about when you were a kid, or if you if you lived someplace else and went back to that house and you're an adult and your parents are the same age they were when you were a little kid. You know, all of this stuff. You know, time isn't important, but of course it's all tied together because we've got these uh, uh, pyramidal cells and they do move horizontally. The, the dendrites are connected horizontally, but primarily it's, it's a vertical uh, structure. So if I'm thinking about baseball, if, if I'm thinking about baseball, I'm thinking about one thing, of course, and I'm not going to all of a sudden have some strange thought about when I was a little kid uh, and my, my house in Indiana, which I'm going back to over the weekend. That ought to be interesting. My brother lives there, so we'll see what happens.
<laughs> I called him on the phone Friday night, telling him, oh, I'm going to be there next week. Can I, can I, do you have an extra bed for me to sleep in? And uh, we, we talked for two and a half hours about nothing, just nothing. You know, everything was just kind of stuck together. Everybody's here. He's Okay, so that's the way it works. And normally, uh, the your your thought processes are fair are relatively in a, like in a silo. Everything is vertical, and that's one of the reasons why you can title things together. And sometimes, of course, these dendrites. Sometimes the connectors don't work quite right, and you can't come up with a piece of information. But it's there, and you know it's there, and you can feel it, and you, you know it's in your brain. You're trying to burp the damn thing out, and you can't quite get that word out. Can't find it, um, and, and that's because one of these dendrites, the, the uh, you haven't found the proper cue uh, to, to stimulate that dendrite so that you can find that piece of information. <clears throat> Pyramidal cells uh, reach the surface of the cortex, and also they spread horizontally, as I said before. These neurons seem to be arranged in columns, and the columns are what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's a vertical structure. Everything is a vertical structure. So when you think about psychology, you think about Freud, you think about Erickson, you think you put all this stuff together. Now, hopefully, when you think about psychology, you're not only thinking about all the odd things that psych psychology gives you, but also the, the physical structures that we're talking about. And that's the reason for physiological psychology, because we need to tie all this stuff together. Eventually, when we start talking about medication, and we will talk about medication in this class, <clears throat> when you talk about medication, one of the things you're talking about is how, why it works in your brain. It, it stimulates the serotonin level, okay? So what does serotonin do? Serotonin makes you happy. We know that because uh, when we give somebody Prozac or, um, or Paxil, uh, it stimulates your serotonin. Now we can do exactly the same thing by uh, dropping acid or uh, what else can we do? Uh, taking ecstasy will increase our serotonin level. That's going to make us happy. But of course, we don't treat people with ecstasy or with LSD, even though these drugs were invented because we were looking for a way to stimulate your serotonin. And it turned out that it was, for a, it was for too short a period of time, so we really couldn't use ecstasy. Not only that, but it, was, uh, it increased your serotonin level so much that it became toxic and it destroyed your serotonin-producing cells. And we certainly didn't want to you know, make somebody unhappy. And of course, eventually, of course, you can't get happy anymore because we just destroyed all your serotonin-producing cells. Anyway, so th these are the, the reasons that we're, we talk about these things. We want you to understand the structure of the pharmaceuticals that we're, that we're giving people. We want you to understand all of this. You may become counselors. If you become counselors, of course, you're going to be trying, you're going to be talking to people and trying to get them uh, to be happier uh, in one way or, the, or another, or to solve their own problems. How do we do that? Well, Maybe we give them a medication that increases a select uh, neurotransmitter in their brains. Many brain regions have distinctive geometric columnar uh, patterns that seem to function as information processing units. And that's one of the things that we need to, to understand. So if you're somebody like uh, Sheldon Cooper, who is a fictional character on television, of course, uh, but this is an individual that seems to know everything. Uh, he has what is referred to as an eidetic memory. He never forgets anything. In other words, he has created the cues in his brain so that he can find these little pieces of information. And everything that you've ever heard or ever read is potentially is still in your brain someplace. It's stuck in there somewhere. Now the problem is finding the cues to get that piece of information out. And if you've ever watched Jeopardy or any of those other quiz shows, uh, these individuals seem to have the capability of finding that piece of information, so using something as a cue and getting that information out. And of course, Sheldon Cooper has an eidetic memory, so he can remember everything. Or he remembers a lot of things, even though in some episodes he doesn't remember everything. But he can't uh, interact with, with people in a, in a normal social setting. He doesn't seem to have that capability. <clears throat> Some columns begin at the surface and extend all the way to the white matter, and of course th these, are little, these are pieces of information that we're looking for. 
one of the things that we do in the United States is we teach for expertise. Uh, in other words, uh, if you uh, we, we we very rarely look for generalists. We very rarely uh, educate people to have lots and lots of different information. Obviously, my technological skills are not very good. <laughs> Since I just brought, bought my first cell phone, everybody else has had a cell phone all their lives. And here I am, I'm 67 years old, and I just bought my first cell phone. I had a flip phone, and it, but it wasn't the same. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to text on this flip phone, but it's really, really tough. It's actually easier. You think it's easier on a flip phone? Okay. But you have to, uh, what do you do? Uh, there's always three letters, so you have to hit it three times or something in order to get whatever letter you want. I don't know. I never, I never could text, and I can't even find it. My wife texts me now, and I, I don't know how to get my text messages. I have no idea. She's going to have to show me when I see her this weekend, which is the real reason I'm going to Indiana is to see my wife. Uh, I haven't seen her for six weeks. It seems like forever or more. I can't remember the last time I saw her. Uh, what are we doing? Okay, so we're, we're communicating with ourselves. So sometimes the, uh, these columns uh, go from the, the uh, surface to the, uh, to the white matter. And the, this, is, this is your expertise. So I've studied in four different areas. Is that right? I've studied English. I know, it's my, my first bachelor's degree. I worked in the laboratory and I have a degree in laboratory technology. Uh, I have a degree in international relations and I have a degree in two, three degrees in psychology. Two degrees in psychology, two degrees, okay, yeah, okay. So that's four different areas of expertise. Uh, and I tell you this only because <clears throat> a lot of individuals will only study one thing their entire lives. They decide they want to be a veterinarian. Uh, so they start studying biology when they're in high school. Then when they go to college, they get their bachelor's degree in biology and anatomy or something, or comparative anatomy. Then they go to uh, vet school and they get their DVM, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. They get their DVM and then for the rest of their lives, the only thing that they ever look at, the only thing that they study, the only thing that they care about is uh, medicine. Uh, and it's not medicine, it's, it's animal medicine. But you can imagine how difficult it is to be a vet because you not only have to know cows and horses, large animals, but you also have to know dogs and cats and maybe someday somebody will bring you in a reptile, you know, a, a frog or something you have to fix or whatever. So you have to know all of this stuff. You have to know all of these little pieces of information. What's the normal temperature of a dog? Does anybody have a clue? It's like 102 degrees. I know, four, four degrees hotter than we are. Anyway, so we create these columns, and these columns go all the way down to the white matter. Those tend to be our expertise. Some people are generalists. I'm a generalist. I have lots of different information. I know literature. <clears throat> I, know the, I know medicine. Uh, I know politics. And I know psychology. You know, that's four different areas. And one of the things I told you, or one of the things I keep telling my students, the more information you can accumulate, the better a psychologist you're going to be. Because you're going to be able to understand people on more than just a psychological level. If you only study psychology, that's the only information you're going to have. But if we have done other things in our lives, we have other expertise, of course, we're expanding that, that uh, gray matter in our brains, and of course that's, that's a really positive thing. Now there's no problem in only studying one thing, and you know, that's the way the American educational system seems to be working, but um, I, would, I would suggest to you that you, you accumulate as much information as you possibly can. Find interests outside of your own area of expertise. The human cerebral cortex contains about a million cortical columns. So we, have, we potentially have that much information that we can study. Now somebody like uh, Sheldon Cooper, who is a fictional character, I understand that, but there are people just like Sheldon. Uh, they have a lot of information about a lot of different things. And that's a really, really positive thing, as, as I can see. 
because not if you only know one thing, you tend to be myopic. Myopic means you can only see one thing. And if you're only if you're myopic, something else is going to happen and you're not going to tie it together. But the more information you have, the more likely you are to be able to encompass that. To have ideas that are global. So you can see politics affecting um, the environment. Uh, you can see the economy affecting the environment. You can see all of these different things because we have we have that kind of knowledge. We understand those those different things. But somebody who's an economist, they only see the world from any from a, a money point of view. They can't see it from politics or from from uh, uh, social wel welfare. They can only see it from one point of view, and that's part of the problem. We get individuals with one piece of information, and they they grab a hold of that, they adhere to that, as if that's the only important piece of information. But when we're talking about politics, of course, word it takes in everything. If you can imagine being a politician, as Aaron will tell you, you've got to know everything. You've got to have, you've got to have knowledge in a lot of different areas. And if you ever actually do expand into politics where you're trying to take care of more than one thing, you've got to understand Everything <laughs> you got to understand. You got to understand money, especially money. You're going to get into all kinds of trouble if you don't understand money. Uh, if you got to understand the economy, you got to understand um, social welfare. You, yeah, you got to take care of people. Uh, you can imagine a congressman. All of a sudden, they get they get into Congress and they've got all these bills and they're about a lot of different things. And this guy. He's a radio guy, that, you know, he's a good talker, and that's the reason he was elected, you know, and he has no knowledge about anything. And all of a sudden, he has to vote on a bill that has to do with appropriations. <laughs> My God, you can imagine. Anyway, we need all the information that we can get, and that's where, and they come in the, these vertical columns that we're talking about. Most cerebral communication uh, runs vertically, but there are some that, that, uh, that is uh, horizontal communication. Um, uh, a good athlete. This is really kind of interesting. I was, uh, I was talking to an individual who was a uh, played for the Los Angeles Dodgers back in the 1950s, and he played with all these famous, famous people. He was a really cool guy. Long conversation. He didn't play baseball. He's a professional baseball player, and uh, he went to the Dodgers after a couple of years in the minors. Uh, but he didn't play baseball at all. He was a basketball player, and he but he was an athlete. And so he was able to take that 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 capability that this athletic that's this athleticism, and he was able to to uh, translate that into baseball. He was a really really good basketball player. But at the time, of course, professional basketball was this is in the 1940s 1950s. There wasn't much to professional basketball, so he became a professional baseball player just for the money, and he was really quite good. He was very good. Sweet Lou was his name. I can't remember his last name. Interesting fellow. The point is, of course, communication. So I didn't do, somebody like uh, LeBron James or somebody like uh, uh, Michael Jordan, fabulous basketball player, but the guy could also play baseball. Not that good, I guess, but not well enough to play Major League Baseball. But I mean, now he's a golfer. He's a scratch golfer, and the guy's really, really good. So you can translate one type of athleticism to another, and that's, that has to do with this horizontal communication that we're talking about. The cortical uh, columns of the neocortex are arranged in six distinct layers. However, most communication is vertical, and select neurons will extend through several layers, some through all six layers. And as we can see, what we're talking about is organization. Just like in this, this cerebellum, we're talking about organization. And one of the things that we see in schizophrenia is disorganization. So whereas we can look at, a, uh, at somebody's brain and we can look at it under a microscope and we see all of this neuronal uh, organization taking place, if we looked at an individual with schizophrenia, it wouldn't be this organized. <clears throat> Now, there are a lot of interesting things that take place with individuals uh, throughout their lives. Uh, and we, we will take out all of the things that we don't need anymore uh, at different junctures during our lives. Uh, when we're a little baby, we, we need one piece of information. So when we turn three and four, 
uh, one of the things that happens is that we prune out all that information we don't need anymore when we were three and four. And then when we turned 12, we had all that information that we needed uh, in order to learn languages and whatnot. And then when we turned 12, all of a sudden that capability is gone because that becomes pruned out of your brain. You don't need it anymore, so it's taken out. It's taken away. And then we go through puberty, and when, as we are uh, maturing to the point of being an adult, uh, in our middle 20s, we don't actually reach maturity until the middle 20s. At that stage, we get more of our brain cells pruned, the stuff we don't need anymore, and now all of a sudden we're an adult. So it's really kind of interesting. A lot of times, an individual who is going to have schizophrenia is going to develop schizophrenia during his adolescence. Why? Because he, uh, up to this point, uh, th these are being pruned out. All of these, all these bad areas are being pruned out. Anything that you don't need anymore is being taken away. And then dur during puberty, one of the things that is happening is that we, we're having a last um, um, a massive pruning that's taking place. And if there's disorganization in any of these layers, then it's going to manifest itself uh, after the last pruning. So normally, when we see somebody that has schizophrenia, they will drift into schizophrenia during their adolescence. And by the time they're 25 years old, they're a full-fledged, raving, literally a raving lunatic, because they have, uh, they, now they have schizophrenia. And in order just to control them, we're going to have to give them medications to control them. For one thing, we need to control their dopamine level. If we can control their dopamine level, we'll make them uh, easier to manage. What else is taking place? Okay, so I was talking about schizophrenia. The reality is that we all want to be normal, and so we are struggling to be normal all the time. Uh, it's usually not that much of a struggle. But if you're schizophrenic, and you're around all of these other individuals that are acting normally, you want to act normally as well. Okay, so let's smoke some pot. Normally, you're, you've got control over what's going on in your brain because you think about it. I'm sorry? No, I was just I was saying, like, one, um, I don't know, for me, maybe just a, a stereotype for me, but like when I think of uh, schizophrenics, like I automatically jump to like, a murderer. I don't know if that's okay. I mean, that big well, that's, that's, that's those are the ones that we hear about. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. But it's it's a very small percentage of people. Uh, normally, they're just they're not very functional. Mm -hmm. Terror, and if you have try to have a conversation with them, that doesn't make any sense because they're tying a lot of information to things that you know to odd things that aren't in, in the room. Okay, so I'm trying to have a conversation with you about the trash can, and all of a sudden I start talking about my car and, and, and the fact that my car can fly, you know. All of these, these weird thoughts are just kind of, and it, it has to do with this disorganization. Because normally if, I, if we're talking about a trash can, my brain is thinking trash can, and I can follow this column of thought, this pattern of thought, all the way to, until we're done with our conversation and it will stay on trash cans, right? Or maybe it will take, take another, you'll say something that will, will remind me of something and now we've, we're talking about something else. Does that make sense? Okay, but if I'm schizophrenic, this isn't organized. So as soon as I, we start talking about trash cans, all of a sudden my brain is going off in another direction because instead of in a, moving in a linear pattern, in a straight line from trash can to trash can to trash can, all of a sudden I've got red in my mind and then I've got car in my mind and then all of these things tie together in a very disorganized pattern. So instead of, instead of a, being in a column, now all of a sudden I'm just all over the place. And that's what happens with somebody with schizophrenia. Normally during their adolescence, they are able to control to control their thoughts, to control their thought patterns, because it, but it's a struggle for them. It's a lot harder for them than it is for us because you know we're just we have normal thought patterns all the time. We don't have to worry about it. This guy has to concentrate in order to maintain 
lucidity, to be lucid, so that he doesn't have all these strange thoughts running throughout his brain. I'm going to talk about somebody that was a murderer that, that makes a lot of sense in just a second. Okay, but let's, so let's say that uh, you smoke pot. Pot's not that intrusive. I mean, it really isn't. It doesn't really change a whole lot. But what it does change is he loses control of his brain. All of a sudden, he doesn't have control of his brain anymore. And because of that, all of this disorganization that has, is all, has already taken place, now he, he can't get it back together again. And that's, what, why, that's why marijuana causes, uh, uh, can kick you into schizophrenia. It's because now all of a sudden he doesn't have control. And he just lost it for what? I don't know. Um, being stoned doesn't last that long, only, only an hour, maybe, maybe two hours. But that's all he needs to, to lose complete control of what's going on in his brain. Now all of a sudden he's starting to have all kinds of crazy thoughts. Uh, the guy that shot uh, uh, Gabby Giffords down in uh, uh, Tucson, uh, if you look at him, if you look at him when he was in high school, he, you know, there were sometimes he would have some really strange thoughts. Uh, but then, as he got older and went to college, now all of a sudden he's having more trouble controlling himself. At some stage, something happened. This guy was saying that, um, uh, and, and you can use you can use drugs to control your thoughts. You can stay drunk all the time, and then you don't have to control your thoughts. Uh, you can smoke pot all the time, and, and people just think you're stoned. But what happened with Loeffner was that Jared Loeffner was the guy's name. What happened with Loeffner, he stopped smoking pot. So as long as he was smoking pot, he was self-medicating. As long as he was, he was smoking pot, then he was able to control things. But as soon as he stopped smoking pot, all of a sudden, all bets were off, and he decides to buy a gun and and shoot Gabby Giffords in the head. Now, theoretically, he's not a, um, uh, he wasn't, uh, what was the word I'm looking for? And I forget. See, now I've lost my thought. <laughs> I'm schizophrenic, or probably in my case, I have Alzheimer's disease. But <laughs> uh, he wasn't uh, very political, but for some reason he obsessed on Gab Gabby Giffords. And that's what uh, somebody with schizophrenia will do. They will uh, obsess. They will focus. Uh, as long as they can think about that one thing, they can keep their mind uh, uh, in a pattern that seems almost normal. And that's actually what he did. Unfortunately, when he stopped smoking pot, uh, this not only became an obsession, but it also, he became violent at that stage, uh, which is a special case as, as far as schizophrenia is concerned. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you. That's why I woke up thinking about this morning. This, all this disorganized thought. Because I was having a dream, and in my dream I was just flying all over the place. Uh, a lot of different pieces of information. Um, I, you know, I was in charge of this, and I had to do that. And, you know, that's the, the normal, when you're in the military, you've got to do all of these things, and they, they all take place in a linear fashion. But, of course, I had all these other pieces of information, like being in college and being on a college campus and all kinds of crazy stuff that didn't make a whole lot of sense. But still, in my dream, it was if everything followed different steps. The steps just didn't make a whole lot of sense because it was a dream. Come on, let's get real. Uh, have you seen the movie uh, Split or not? Uh -huh. Split? It's pretty interesting how they, how they um, I guess, kind of control the personality of a schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenic person. Oh, is that right? The person has like 20-something different personalities, but... Oh, um, then she yeah. learns how to, how to control his 20 different yeah. personalities. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Interesting. I contend that one of the reasons that our, uh, the movies that we're seeing now are, are of a specific type. Um, you, you don't have to remember what happened in the beginning of the movie anymore. Uh, you just have to remember what happened five minutes ago. Uh, I think it, it's because there are so many people smoking pot. And the people that are writing these movies are smoking pot too. So they can't really tie things together like in the old days. A movie that starts off with, you got to remember this. And, you know, it follows a specific pattern. And 
and, and it just kind of cascades until you're at the end of the movie, and everything everything ties together. We don't tie things together anymore. We I have. No, I, I agree with that, but I think it's really just culture now. Like even with social media, we want to be entertained quickly. We're in the microwave generation of like exactly. You know, entertaining now. That that's a good point. That's a good point as well. Yeah, we're. Our uh, attention uh, it doesn't last for, yeah. for very long anymore. But that also has to do with, can have, have to do with marijuana. Okay, I don't know where I'm going with this one time. Okay, um, okay so we, we need, also need to protect the brain. And one of the ways that we protect the brain is with our uh, meninges. Uh, this is a covering over the brain. Uh, meninges just means uh, membrane. And this is extremely important because the blows that we have to the brain, uh, potentially um, if we fall off of a, uh, uh, if we fall down and we, we puncture our skull, uh, potentially we will uh, we'll damage our brain. But of course, in this case, we've got a membrane that covers it. Uh, there's actually three membranes, and these are the three membranes. One, two, and three, these are the three membranes of the, uh, of the brain. And these are our meninges. <clears throat> meningitis is an infection of the meninges. Uh, meningitis is actually quite rare. We don't see it very often. Most bacteria can't uh, invade the brain. Most, hardly anything can invade the brain. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but we have, so we have these, these three uh, different coverings in the brain to protect it. Uh, the outer layer is a tough envelope uh, of cells called the dura mater, and dura means, uh, means hard, and mater means mother in Latin, so it means hard mother. And it's a hard mother, that's for sure. <laughs> that's the astrocytes, the astrocytes that tie them each other uh, together. The, the glial cells uh, make up the dura mater. In the middle, uh, we, uh, we have a middle layer called the uh, we, the arachnoid is in there. Uh, this is how the uh, CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, flows. This is where all the fluid uh, goes. We have a, a layer of fluid, and that's cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid runs throughout the central nervous system, runs throughout the brain and throughout the spinal column. If we needed to find out what was in the cerebrospinal fluid, we could puncture your spine, not your spinal column, but we could go into the spinal column and uh, we could take a needle, punch it through the dura mater, which is also covers the, uh, the spinal column, into this area right here, and we could draw some of that out. Okay. <clears throat> and I've, done, I've seen this done. I haven't done, actually done it myself, but a doctor has to do it. Uh, you can do that. You can puncture somebody's spinal column. And you can puncture into somebody's spinal column. Of course, if you go too far, you'll do damage to the nerve cells, and you certainly don't want to do that. It's kind of a dangerous operation. Uh, but when we're talking about select things, uh, we have to get cerebrospinal fluid. Right now, there is, a, um, there is a marker. We do have a marker for Alzheimer's disease. But in order to find that marker, we have to get CSF. Cerebrospinal fluid. So we have to draw off a, a CSF uh, specimen in order to find out if this person has, has Alzheimer's disease. Actually, this is such an intrusive procedure that normally we will not do that. We will just assume from the symptoms the individual has that they have, uh, that they have Alzheimer's disease. The inner layer is a delicate membrane known as the pia matter, and pia means gentle, uh, so it's gentle mother. Uh, I was looking at something last night. Oh, um, the lady that uh, murdered her five children, uh, Andrea Yates. Remember Andrea Yates? She drowned her five babies. She had five kids, seven to six months old, and she drowned them all in the bathtub. You don't remember this. Good. <laughs> her middle name was Pia. <laughs> Andrea Pia Yates. I just found that out last night. It was kind of fascinating. Anyway, and of course, I was putting this lecture together, and I know that Pia means gentle in Latin, so... I don't know. Interesting. Uh, I was reading something about her last night, and it said that she, uh, yes, she murdered her five children, uh, but now she watches home videos of when her children were alive. As sick as that is. That was 15 years ago that she murdered her children. 
you guys were probably three years old at the time. Anyway, so we have three, three layers. Uh, meningitis is, is an infection of the cerebral spinal fluid. It's an infection of the meninges. And the problem is that, of course, this is a covering uh, of the brain. Uh, if it becomes infected, then it will swell. It will swell and it will put pressure on the brain. It will kill the, uh, the individual. This is really a serious problem if you have a child uh, and the child gets meningitis. This is really something that can, can, uh, can kill them fairly quickly uh, because uh, we have to treat it with antibiotics, of course. And once we do that, uh, normally we can knock it out, but we have to be very specific as to what type of antibiotic we treat them with. It has to be able to kill that bacteria. If we give them a broad spectrum antibiotic, it probably won't take care of the problem and the child will die. What's one of, and this was, was one of the jobs I had when I was in service. Uh, one of my jobs uh, was to identify the bacteria, uh, to identify bacteria. And we had a child that came down with meningitis. Uh, we, uh, I did culture it. Uh, I got a specific answer. Um, unfortunately, the child was Army. Uh, and I'm not complaining about the Army, but uh, we were Air Force, they were Army. We got the specimen first, and because we got the specimen first, we were about a day ahead of them. Uh, so I identified it as something that isn't very common. And the Army guy identified it as something that was common. Okay. Now I'm a de whole day ahead of, of this other guy, maybe 12 hours ahead of him. So I told the doctors this is what it was. And he, they said, wow, that's rare. We hardly ever see that. It was Neisseria, um, it was Neisseria parainfluenza, as compared to Neisseria uh, influenza, which is far more common, and causes a lot more problems, uh, can potentially cause a lot more problems. And I told him it's parainfluenza. And the Army, I was an enlisted person. I was a staff sergeant at the time. And I had just got my, my uh, line for uh, E6. Anyway, so there was a lab officer at the, at the Army Hospital, and of course the Army and the Air Force, there's all that tension going on, and he identified it as influenza. So they treated the child because it, he was, uh, it was an Army child. They treated it for influenza, and it was parent influenza. I was right, he was wrong, and the baby died because they didn't treat it with the right antibiotic. You know? But after that baby died, there were five babies, and they were flying them. We were, from, flying, we were in Europe, and we were flying them back to the States, and the baby died in, in the flight. And as soon as uh, the baby didn't respond to the antibiotic, they switched to the antibiotic <coughs> for parent influenza, and all four of the other babies. All the other four babies lived. What happened? What did I do? What did I do? Oh, shipper. Oh, that's what's happening. Okay. I've got it muted so they can't hear us. Bless you. <laughs> the camera's off. There's no one in class. Okay, now we're okay. Don't worry about those other guys. Okay, so that's a sad, sad story about men meningitis. That's a sad story about what we're talking about here. Uh, but of course, it is demonstrative of, of how dumb the army goes. <laughs> Actually, our training, Air Force training, was better than our training. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so that's the meninges, and that protects the, uh, the human brain. The brain is a solid mass, <laughs> but there are open areas. Uh, I was looking at a, uh, I was watching something yesterday, and they were talking about this lady with Alzheimer's disease and how it was eating her brain away. Well, it wasn't really eating her brain away. What was happening, she wasn't using her brain anymore because she has Alzheimer's disease. So the open areas were becoming larger and larger and larger. 
Nothing was being eaten away. It was just from uh, disuse. Uh, her brain was going away. There are four open areas, and these are called ventricles. Ventricles one and two are lateral ventricles in each hemisphere. These are the, this is one and two. Uh, ventricle three is between the hemispheres uh, below one and two, and that's this area right here. And then uh, area four is in front of the cerebellum. It's right down here. So you have four ventricles, and one of the things that uh, we didn't even think about ventricles or care about ventricles until, uh, until Muhammad Ali, we, we did the, the first brain scan on Muhammad Ali. And what we discovered was that he had Parkinson's disease. He had, uh, he had CTE, as, as similar to uh, what football players get, and the, his brain was slowly deteriorating from the inside from the inside out. So those ventricles were becoming larger and larger and larger, unfortunately. Anyway, the ventricles are actually quite important. Uh, the ventricles are, are, aren't empty. They are uh, they're filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is extremely important because it not only uh, delivers nutrients to the brain, but it also is a uh, acts as a shock absorber. So the, the more uh, cerebrospinal fluid that you have, the uh, less likely you'll have brain damage if something happens to your head. Ventricles. CSF is produced in the choroid plexus, a portion of the lining of the ventricles. So that's where CSF comes from. CSF, if you look at it, it's clear. Hopefully, if it's not clear, you got a problem. Uh, it's basically just plasma. It's basically just blood with with the blood take with the red cells taken out uh, and the white cells taken out. So it's just clear fluid. Uh, if you injured your knee and your knee filled up with fluid, it would be it fill up with uh, with not CSF, of course. It would fill up with plasma and fill up with a uh, liquid portion of your of your uh, blood, and if we and, and hopefully it's not bleeding into your joint, uh, because uh, <clears throat> one of the things that happens when you get blood in into an area, uh, if it's not circulating blood, uh, your body has to take it out, and the only way to take it out is to lyse it, is to break it is to break it up. And that's one of the reasons why bruises last for such a long time, uh, because they're, it's blood and it has to be taken out. Uh, the longer blood sits in an area, the more damage that that blood will do because the body is trying to get rid of that blood, so it will lyse it and it can do damage to the tissue in the area when it sends that lysing uh, structure into that area. So you got, you've got to get that stuff off. You've got to draw it off as best you can. Hopefully, if you get a bruise, it only lasts for a couple days. Uh, as soon as it turns uh, yellow and green, you're okay because the blood's breaking down. The longer it stays as blood in your system, the more potential damage there is. And that's one of the reasons why if your knee swells up, uh, they, will, they will draw the fluid out. And hopefully, it will be clear fluid. As long as it's clear fluid, you're okay. That just means that the body has pumped fluid into the area to immobilize your joint. But if it's blood, now we got a problem because potentially if it stays on that joint, it's gonna break the joint down. It's, gonna, it's going to damage the uh, ligaments. It's going to damage your meninges if it's your knee. So, uh, I got a question. Um, meniscus, I'm sorry, I said meniscus. No, um, so um, when I was in Afghanistan, it was a uh, ID blast went off and everything, and it's is it jelly like or not not jelly like but kind of what well, he had to sustain an ID blast he didn't, he didn't make it but it started running from his ear when I was wondering if that that that's possible for it to run yeah. out of your ear and everything like that get sustain something really get hit his head hard enough yeah. that's that's really what that's one of the things we're looking for is bleeding from the eyes for one thing but also mm -hmm. bleeding from the it means we got a lot of damage going on in there, and, and he potentially, and he did make it, of course. Yeah. So I, I was just wondering, because if, if, that, if that's really what it was, it was coming out of his ear, because I wondered, 
I, if it's if it's clear fluid, it's cerebrospinal fluid, and now we got a really serious problem because yeah. he's got a, he's got a, it's busted through his his dura mater, and we've got cerebrospinal fluid leaking out mm -hmm. uh, through his orifice. Yeah. yeah, usually it's it's blood out of your nose, uh, but if we've got clear fluid leaking from anywhere, we got a really serious problem. A skull fracture will do that. A blow to the head, and normally they're fatal because if we've got cerebrospinal fluid coming out. There's a lot of damage that has taken place. A lot of, and we've, we see that a lot, especially with explosions, because it's the pressure of the explosion mm -hmm. rather than the blow. I mean, if you get knocked against the wall, that's one thing. But a lot of times, it's just the pressure will, will uh, fracture the skull. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. The only reason I remember it distinctly is because I was calling when I was calling it in. Right. You know, they were describing me. You, know, you have to give a description of what, what, what exactly. the body's going through and everything. So I was kind of like, you know, just. Looks like water coming out of his ear and everything. It was like really snot like almost. Yeah, it's like sweet or spot. When we talked to the doctor, he's like, yeah, it's, uh, that looks like uh, brain fluid. Like, Oops. Yeah, so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, sorry about that. I didn't mean to <laughs> bring back sad memories. <laughs> no, I was, just, I was just thinking about it, and it's, uh, it's something that, you know, that always stood out to me, and I just had a question about yeah. it. So. Yeah, it was cerebral spinal fluid. And like I said, it's. Pretty fatal. I mean, it's, it's, it means a, a lot of damage, a lot of serious damage. So, uh, so what are we doing with cerebral spinal fluid? So it's primarily, and if there's anything in there, if there's blood in there, now we got a problem. If there's white cells in there, it means that we have an infection in the meninges. And this is what we would do. We would draw the cerebral spinal fluid off of the individual that we thought maybe had meningitis, and if it, if, if it was cloudy at all, now we got a problem. Now we got a real serious problem because those are probably white cells. And if they're white cells, it means that they're fighting an infection, and the infection is in the cerebrospinal fluid. And they do have meningitis. We need to treat them right away. We need to figure out what it is and treat them right away. We treat them with the wrong thing, they die. So it's, it's especially with babies because they're you know they're they're much much smaller, so we we only have a select amount of time before we can uh, might potentially lose them. The function of the cerebrospinal fluid includes uh, it acts as a shock absorber for the brain, and this is a really good thing. That's what was going on with that individual. It was a shock absorber for the brain. Uh, it, something had broken. The men the men, uh, meninges had broken, had 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 ruptured, and the the fluid was leaking out in any place that it could. They could find that we have a closed system. There's no open area that anything can go into except for your mouth and your digestive system to some extent. So once that that bursts, once his meninges burst, it had to go the, to the only orifice that it could find, and that was that was the ear in this case, because the ear is inside, you know, in the, inside the skull. You also have your sinuses, uh, but of course your sinuses are a closed system. It's closed away from the brain, but the ear is not. So things can get in through your ear. Well, they can't because, it's, like I said, it's a closed system. And, but things can come out, but they can't really go in. Um, and if, if you watch, well, <laughs> these are science fiction shows, okay? So if you watch, uh, they, if they're going to put something into somebody's brain, they always put, put it in through their, their ear. They have to because... If you put it in through the nose, it'll just go into the digestive system. I know, it seems kind of odd. Let's talk about science fiction. The brain floats in CSF, uh, so head movements do not disturb the brain. And it's one of the reasons why you can shake your head and you don't you know, give yourself a concussion uh, if, you, if uh, something happens to your head. Your brain is floating around in this fluid. And uh, so if, if, if it weren't, of course, you, you could move your head and give yourself a a concussion, but that doesn't happen, of course. It collects nutrients from blood vessels and passes them onto the brain surface. So CSF is extremely important. Blood is supplied to the brain through two significant arteries that run uh, on each side of the esophagus, and these are known as the carotid arteries. Carotid means plunge into sleep, which is kind of interesting. The vertebral arteries bracket the spinal cord and, and enter in the base of the skull. So you actually have four arteries that supply your brain with blood. Uh, and there's a reason why you have, uh, it's, a, it's a fallback system. Uh, 
Uh, so if something happens with your carotid arteries, you eat too much fat and you're, you get uh, uh, fat in your arteries, then you've got two more systems uh, that will keep you going. I have a friend that was a runner. Uh, of course, he was a drinker <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, but uh, poor old uh, uh, John had a problem with, uh, with uh, his arteries clogging up. And it was because when he was younger, he ate a lot of fatty foods. He ate bacon. He ate, uh, I don't know. I don't know what he ate. He was a cowboy, so it's hard to tell what the guy ate. But he ate too many fatty foods. Anyway, so he clogged up his arteries pretty good. Uh, they cleaned out his heart. His heart was fine. Uh, but the problem was his carotid arteries were starting to block. And if you've ever gone into the doctor, he may have put a stethoscope against your against your carotid artery. And what he's trying to, to do is determine what the kind of blood flow you got going on with your carotid artery. This happens especially as you get older because this can be a really serious problem. Uh, restricted blood flow to your brain is gonna make you uh, not as smart as you should be. <laughs> so as we get older, one of the things we do is we try to take medications that increase the blood flow in our brains. That's what ginkgo is all about. We take ginkgo or L-carnitine or something to try to increase the blood flow to our, to our brain so that we can maintain our intellectual functioning. Uh, one, of the things, one of the interesting things about killing people is that you can, if you sever one of these carotid arteries, of course, we get, you've got a really serious, serious problem because it's an artery, and arteries pump a lot of blood, and especially the carotid arteries. So you can sever one of these carotid arteries and the guy will bleed out fairly rapidly. If you sever both of them, uh, they'll bleed out even faster. But of course they still have the, uh, the vertebral arteries are still supplying their brain. But as long as you, what you're doing is you're trying to ensanguinate them. In other words, you're trying to, uh, uh, to empty the blood out of their bodies. And as long as you can do that, then you'll kill them. I know this sounds weird, but it's one of the things, unfortunately, that they train you to do. That's funny, as they put, you said plunge into sleep, and that's where you put someone Exactly, that's, that, that's exactly five it. Five seconds, put someone to sleep. Exactly. Exactly. So if you can hinge one of these arteries, you can actually put somebody to sleep. But of course, you don't want to do it for very long because it will cause, it can potentially cause brain damage. Hopefully, anyway, unless that's what you're trying to do. And there are all the, all the arteries and the, and the uh, the veins coming out of the brain. <clears throat> At the base of the, the brain is uh, the carotid and the basal arteries uh, joined to form a structure called the circle of Willis. And that's the circle of Willis right here. This structure right here is the circle of Willis. The merging of these two cerebral arteries provides a backup in case blood flow is impinged in one of the two major arteries. Uh, so as long as we can keep that going, as long as we can keep some blood going into your brain, uh, then you should be okay. You will survive without any brain damage. How am I doing on time? 10.02 or 10.12? 10.15? Okay. 10.18. <laughs> <laughs> wow, your clock, your watch is really fast. Despite the rich tissue of the brain and the, and the myriad of viruses and bacteria, seeking entry infection into this organ is rarely, it rarely, rarely occurs. Viruses and bacteria cannot get into the brain, and the reason is because the capillaries into the brain are smaller than the capillaries in any other part of your body. And this is known as the, the blood-brain barrier. And it's a good thing. I mean, there's just tons of horrible stuff out there. Zika virus, hantavirus, uh, Ebola virus, all kinds of viruses. And if, if, the, if it had free access to the brain, this is extremely rich tissue. It's fatty fatty tissue, and if we were going to uh, uh, culture something, the brain tissue would be perfect because it's rich. It's rich in, in uh, uh, it's got lots of blood in it, it's got all the food in the world in it, so all the bacteria and all the viruses in the world are trying to get into your brain. But it rarely happens. Meningitis happens. But it's rare bacteria that can get into your brain. 
luckily, because otherwise none of our babies would survive because they, they're uh, uh, very, they're f far, f their immune system is, is uh, different from uh, adult immune systems. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to protect the brain. And the brain is very well protected through this blood-brain barrier. Normal bacteria that get, goes anyplace else uh, cannot get into the brain. Uh, when I was working in uh, the Air Force and I was a lab te laboratory technician, we had a lady came, that came in and she had gonorrhea everywhere, but it didn't get into her brain. It killed her, but it's because it got into to every place else. You don't think of gonorrhea as something like that. It stays in the reproductive system. But this individual had somehow introduced it into her. She had it septicemically. So it was a really serious problem. She died. Okay, so back, most bacteria does, cannot get into the brain, and, and it doesn't. And that's one of the reasons why meningitis is such a serious, serious problem. Uh, it infected those babies. We had five babies with meningitis but we were able to save four of them. And we would have saved the fifth one if they'd given it the right antibiotic the first time. But it was the first baby that got sick, so she's the one that we drew all the blood from. The cerebrospinal fluid from, and we had to, to, uh, we had to figure out what it was. We had to figure out what the bacteria was so that they could treat her. It was a race against time, and we lost, unfortunately. Well, why we lost was because the army guys are such arrogant. <laughs> I almost said something else. Okay, so the blood-brain barrier is extremely important. An angiogram is an x-ray of the blood vessels, and the reason we can do that is because we put a, a dye into, the, uh, into your blood, and then we take a picture, we take an x-ray of your, of, your, uh, of your brain. And this is how we can tell if somebody has a blood clot. And this guy actually does have a blood clot right here, right there. <clears throat> Had a heart attack in 2010. Uh, see, my watch says it's 10:16, but I guess it's what time is it really? 10:18. 10:18. Okay. Yeah, I had a heart attack in, in 2010, and uh, they weren't exactly sure what was going on. Uh, so I went to the hospital. Of course, I'm dying, which is always exciting. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so the doctor kept trying to give me morphine because morphine makes you feel better. It also makes you forget your, 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 your pain is actually why they give it to you, so you forget it. Uh, but, you know, morphine doesn't work on me. And so he thought that, there was, that I was arguing. I wanted to argue with him. I just wanted to die, I guess. I don't know what he thought. So he gave me a medication that you give to people for stroke. He gave me TBI, I guess is what it is. Uh, anyway, it's, it opens your blood vessels. Um, so if you have a blood clot, it, it uh, dissolves the clot is what it does. So he gave me a shot of this TBI stuff. And uh, I survived, but uh, it wasn't because of the TBI. He thought I was going to have a stroke, is what he thought I was going to have. What an idiot. If a stroke is suspected, uh, an individual can be injected with a dye, and the skull can be x-rayed to show possible hemorrhages, aneurysms, uh, which are just a widening of the, of the blood vessel, or an occlusion. An occlusion is, is a clot of one kind or another. This is uh, usually the uh, first test performed if a patient is suspected of having a stroke. If we can catch them within the first hour, this magic golden hour, uh, right after they first have a stroke, we can give them this TBI, and the TBI will actually take away that uh, it'll take away the blood clot. Almost all of your strokes are caused by blood clots. If it is a hemorrhage or an aneurysm of one kind or another, if we give them the TBI, it will kill them. Whoops. So we have to make sure <laughs> that that's the problem. We have to make sure, otherwise we will actually be killing them. Uh, we can dissolve the clot if we can give them the shot within the hour. And that's what they did with me. They gave me the shot. I didn't, obviously, there's hardly anything wrong, not that much wrong with me, so I guess we're okay. Why don't we stop right here, and I'll, we'll pick this up next time. I'll tell you some more brain stories. <laughs>